we will now set the stage for determinants of square matrices of arbitrary size and not just any given size like 4x4 or 5x5 or even 10 by 10 but for general n by n matrices and let's be reminded of our overarching goal which is to come up with an algebraic expression that evaluates to zero when the matrix is singular and non-zero otherwise. And we have already accomplished this goal quite well for two by two and three by three determinants. Actually, we skip one by one determinants, but let's agree that the determinant of a one by one matrix equals its only entry. This makes perfect sense. When A is zero, then the one column of this matrix is linearly dependent, so to speak, and it's reflected in the zero determinant. And when A is not zero and the one column is linearly independent, then that two is consistent with the non-zero determinant. So this exceedingly simple expression is actually the perfect determinant. It's zero when the matrix is singular and non-zero otherwise. When we were studying two by two determinants, we came up with this formula, which was also perfect in every way. It was robust and it was very concise. Then when it came to three by three matrices, we ended up with this formula, which was still perfectly robust, meaning that it worked for any matrix. However, as far as this formula is concerned, we decided that it's just a little bit too long to be memorized. Nevertheless, we came up with a number of ways to apply this formula without liter literally memorizing it. So at that point, we had to conclude that this formula is also perfectly robust and practical. Let me remind you briefly how we came up with this formula because we're about to repeat the same strategy for four by four matrices. Here is what we did. We assumed that A is not zero and did a little bit of Gaussian elimination and eliminated the two entries below A. At which point the question for the three by three matrix was reduced to its two by two submatrix. And then we could use this already available algebraic criterion to ascertain linear dependence. And when we applied this criterion to this two by two submatrix post Gaussian elimination and multiply the resulting expression by A, we ended up with this expression. Now, can the same strategy be applied to four by four matrices? And the answer is, of course, it can be, and we're about to do it. But before we do that, let me point out one thing. This is not really what we're looking for, because what's next? Five by five, six by six determinants, and so on? Well, yes, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a strategy that would work for the generic dimension N. Our strategy should read, if your matrix is uh, n-dimensional do this. For any n, do this, and the recipe should be pretty much the same for any n. Our strategy cannot read that if the matrix is one by one, just use its only entry. If the matrix is two by two, use this formula. If the matrix is three by three, use this formula. If the matrix is four by four, use the formula we're about to come up with, and so forth. That's not the ideal. That's not quite what we're looking for. So even though we're about to apply the same strategy to the 4x4 matrix, we're only doing it to inspire ourselves to come up or guess the ultimate formula that works for any matrix N. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a mathematical formula. We could call it a strategy. So keep that in mind as we're working towards a 4x4 determinant. And once we're done, we will ask ourselves the following question. Are we happy with where things are going? Things were great here, manageable here. Let's see what happens for the four by four case and then answer that question. So here's what will happen. We'll assume that A is not zero and we'll use Gaussian elimination to eliminate the three entries below. And that will leave us with a rather complicated three by three sub matrix right here, to which we'll then be able to apply this already available algebraic criterion for three by three matrices. We'll apply it, we'll multiply things out, we'll let terms cancel, and then we'll multiply 
the resulting expression by a, just like we did in the 3 by 3 case. And that will leave us with this formula. Well, do we like it? I'll give you a moment to let it sink in. And before we answer that question, I'd like to point out a few of the features of this new formula. It has 24 terms, 12 with a plus sign and 12 with a minus sign. Each term is now a product of four entries from the matrix. And I'll point out one other thing. You will notice that in the 3 by 3 case, a third of the terms had A as a multiple, another third had B, and the remaining third had C. Similarly, in this new 4x4 four four case, a quarter of the terms have A, those are the terms in the first line, a quarter of the terms have B, another quarter have C, and the remaining quarter have D. And this will persist to 5x5 five five and the general n by n case. And these terms also exhibit other patterns that we could discuss now, but we won't, that will eventually allow us to guess the general n by n formula. But now I would finally like to answer the question of, where, of whether we like this formula, and more importantly, whether we like where things are going. Well, with regard to this formula, could we possibly memorize it? And the answer is, I think not. There are just too many terms. Well, perhaps there is a trick for using this formula without memorizing it, just, there, just as there were several tricks in the 3 by 3 case. Well, in this case, I'm not aware of one. And even if there was one, it would probably directly or indirectly entail adding up 24 terms, which is not an attractive prospect. Well, could we capture this formula with computer code and then let computers do all of the calculations for us? And the answer to this question is absolutely yes. We could do that and that's done quite commonly. So in this computer age, we have to conclude that this new 4x4 formula is a success. It is robust and, with the help of computers, it is practical. But do we like where things are going? And to this question, we have to say no, we don't like where things are going because the complexity is growing way too fast. There are just too many terms. How many terms will there be in the 5x5 case? Well, let's see if we can guess the pattern. The 1 by 1 determinant has a single term in it. The 2 by 2 determinant has two terms in it. The 3 by 3, 6. And the new 4, 4 by 4 case has 24 terms in it. And I think we recognize this sequence. It's the factorial sequence. n factorial, the product of numbers from 1 to n. This is 1, this is 1 times 2, this is 1 times 2 times 3, and this is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. So if this pattern persists, and it does, the 5 by 5 determinant will have 120 terms. The 6 by 6 will have 720 terms. The 10 by 10 will have over 3.5 million terms. The 100 by 100 will have over Google terms. And you have to realize that in this day and age, even a 100 by 100 matrix is considered small. We're interested in a thousand by a thousand matrices and a million by a million and beyond. And no computer can possibly keep up with that. So if the general formula, if we derive the general formula, we'll have to admit that at its face value, it is not practical because even the computer couldn't help us use that formula for all but the smallest matrices. So where does that leave us? Are we dead in the water? Should we completely give up on this avenue? And the answer is absolutely not. Because here's what will happen. We'll use the definition to derive a number of important properties of the determinant. And then we'll use those properties to evaluate determinants and to apply determinants in practical situations. This sort of thing happens all the time in mathematics. Let me give you an example from calculus. If you recall, the definite integral is defined as the limit of partial sums as the size of the partitioning of the domain goes to zero. But does anybody use that definition to evaluate integrals? And the answer is, of course not. Anyone in their right mind uses the fundamental theorem of calculus to do that, 
which is a consequence of the definition. And that's exactly what will happen here. The definition will be what it is, and then we'll use the definition to derive the properties, which we'll then use in all practical applications. And now, one final note. Many connoisseurs of linear algebra prefer to introduce determinants differently. What they like to do is to a priori specify the list of properties that the determinant should satisfy. And then they use those properties to show that the general formula with n factorial terms is inevitable. And that's a very attractive approach, and I myself like it very much. And that's the approach that Gil Strang uses in his videos. And in that approach, the properties of the determinant is the definition, and the general formula is the consequence. In our approach, the general formula is the definition, and the properties is the consequence. And part of the reason why I decided to go with our approach is because the perfect videos for the other approach already exist. So let's go on and find out how the determinant unfolds with our approach. So here's what we're going to do next. We'll present the list of key properties of the determinant, but only so that you know what's coming. Then we'll present the general formula as the definition, and we'll proceed to use the definition to derive each of the properties of the determinant. So that's our plan of action.